There's a lot of interest in the uh, John Lewis model and lots of governments have thought it's the answer to all their dreams in terms of sorting out the public sector. Lots of companies have said, we'd like to be John Lewis. They seem to be market leader in terms of customer service. But there's two things. One is the actual structure of John Lewis, which is very unusual because it's uh, owned by a trust on behalf of the people who work there. So there are no outside shareholders, but everybody working in John Lewis is a beneficiary of the trust and all the profits are simply shared out by everybody who works there. Now that's very unusual. Not many companies are gonna to want to go down that track. Some are, uh, family businesses are frequently thinking of changing and going to that, but by and large, the John Lewis model is not necessarily about ownership, it's not necessarily even about profit sharing. It is about a way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking that can be embraced by any company, no matter what their structure, if it's privately owned, if it's supported by banks, if it's a family business. It's a way of thinking which converts the people who work there from saying, well, yes, they do this or they do that to we do this. It's our business and it's the power of we that you get from uh, using a John Lewis approach that really drives a business forward and produces the results you see in the success of John Lewis and of Waitrose. Realistically, most companies aren't going to, to embrace the John Lewis model entirely. I do believe in uh, having some form of profit sharing, but lots of companies waste their money on profit sharing because they dish out a sum of money, but don't follow it up by the communications. Profit sharing only really works if you also engage the, the workforce so that people realize where that profits come from. And that's when you get the multiplier effect, that people are sharing profit, but they're really trying to produce more profit for the business, which is why all shareholders in a business would benefit if a small section of the profits that are made were shared with the workforce. I do believe in that, but it's not fundamental. Uh, businesses which can't share profit, the, the, the public sector, I'd love to see hospitals run on a John Lewis model where there'd be no profit sharing, but there would be the engagement of staff, listening to their views, getting their input, which really lifts efficiency. Never Knowing the Undersold goes uh, right back uh, uh, best part of 100 years now. And it was initially introduced not as something uh, as a customer guarantee, but as a way of making sure that the buyers of products work jolly hard. Uh, the Speed and Lewis said, I don't want the buyers just to go out and buy from middlemen uh, and have an easy time. I want you to go and scour the world, bring in the best products at the best price so that our customers can benefit from that. It, it's probably the best known retail slogan in the country. It's an enormous pressure on the business to maintain it. The, the great deal of effort is put into checking other people's prices, including checking on the internet to make sure that, that the value is there. It can't be guaranteed against every garage in Estonia that's trading on the internet, but against major competition, it's a very real force and it's a, a discipline on the business and everybody working there to deliver on it. I've never believed in ruthless leaders. And uh, yes, there might be some who uh, people who believe that command and control is the way forward. I've always believed in, in teamwork, in sharing views, in, in involving everybody around me. Somebody has got to take the top decisions. Uh, and that's the responsibility that any chief executive takes on board, any manager takes on board. Soft leadership is a disaster in, in any business. People think that at John Lewis, everybody stands around in huddles and decides what to do. No way. It was a very strongly led business. But it's a business where management is in a goldfish bowl. You're prepared to talk to people about why you've made the decisions, to explain, and then involve people. And that's always been my, impro my approach, to involve people in the decisions and then make a group decision. But if it, a group decision doesn't work, well, the chap at the top has to say, this is what we're going to do.
to get a business to last, which is what any business leader wants to do, first of all, you've got to know what you really stand for. Um, and those are, I wouldn't say they're not changeable values, but there are values within a business that says, this is what we're about. Um, uh, this is, we stand for integrity, um, uh, we stand for uh, uh, honesty in what we do, respect both within the business and outside the business, respect for our uh, suppliers as well as our customers. And those core values that, that you do, it, they can go from generation to generation. And that's one of the strengths of John Lewis, uh, that the core values were established over 100 years ago, and they still hold good today. And no, ma no matter how much the business changes, and in retailing, what fun fantastic changes there's been into the way John Lewis and waiters have embraced the internet and said, yes, we, we still have got our important shops, but the internet is there as well. So you can change all the time, but you're changing against a background of, of, of values which is consistent. And if I ask, why is it that uh, John Lewis has such a following of customers and is succeeding in this very uh, changing world. It's because of the consistency of the approach. The, the method of trading has changed, but there has been a consistency which has developed customer trust. And trust is, I think, a key word uh, for any business, certainly any business that is really looking at, are they succeeding with their customers? question is, do your customers really trust you? Lots of people think that John Lewis is uh, employee owned and so it's a cushy number. Everybody's nice to each other. Uh, no decisions are taken. Well, the point everybody's nice to each other is certainly true. And I, I think that a business that shows respect and engages people, that it's a happier place to work. Happiness is a key ingredient, but it's tough. It really struck me when I joined John Lewis from the civil service, just what a disciplined organization it was, how high the expectations were in terms of work output, behavior, standards of dress. Um, it, it's tough, and but that's partly self-imposed. People say, this is our business. We want it to do well, and we this is what we're going to do. Now, when it comes to taking tough decisions, uh, that can be particularly hard in employee-owned business. We have, uh, when I was there sometimes, to close down units. We closed down two of our department stores in London, made 400 people redundant in each of them. But you don't duck that decision. You take it carefully, sensitively, but you still take it. It's the uh, retailing doesn't allow soft options. Um, and certainly John Lewis and Waitrose don't take soft options. John Lewis has uh, obviously uh, got a slightly different approach to recruitment because you're not just recruiting somebody to a job, you're recruiting them to be part of the John Lewis partnership. And one of the things we did was um, abolish job application forms and made them partnership application forms. So right from the beginning, we're saying, if all you're th interested in is a job, perhaps you should go and work for Tesco or Marks and Spencer. If you're interested in getting engaged with a business, being part of it, come and talk to us. So right from the beginning, you're setting a different agenda uh, that we want you really to be part of the business, part of its success. And then through the process, you're looking how is uh, this job applicant responding? Have they got the right attitude? You can have people who are extremely competent in terms of technical skills or product knowledge, but if they don't have the right attitude, they're never going to really do put across your particular perspective to the customers. So recruit for attitude, train for skills is something which works at John Lewis, I'm sure should work much better in many other businesses.
We worked very hard in John Lewis to understand what the values of the business were in terms of integrity and, uh, and the way people work together, primarily as an internal uh, exercise to be sure we were true to what we were doing. What we found was actually it rebounded with our customers. Customers could buy most of the things you can get at John Lewis anywhere on the high street or now anywhere on the internet. Why do they shop at John Lewis? Because they have a sense of trust when they come there. They trust that they're going to be well treated, trust that if something goes wrong, they'll be able to come back uh, and, and get it sorted. I loved it when a, a journalist was writing about Waitrose and said, Waitrose doesn't have customers, it has a congregation. That's what any business wants to have, where the customers really are shouting for you. They're on your side, they're advocates for you, instead of just coming and doing a transaction. My real interest is talking to businesses that really want to engage their staff more. Not doing it as a token, I mean, lots of businesses say, yes, well, we want to, um, uh, our staff to feel engaged, but they're not serious about it. But I firmly believe that for businesses to succeed in a competitive world, they've got to really have all of their staff on board. And apart from anything else, it makes the whole business much more fun if everybody's pulling in the same direction. And that's what I try to put across. I always like to have an idea about what the business is trying to get out of it. Um, because if I'm coming along, uh, uh, I want to really help them to uh, fulfill their own objectives. So hearing from them, why they're interested in me coming along, what they're trying to get out of the conference is really valuable and, and I'll then adapt uh, what I'm going to say to suit them. Uh, I also can pick up the language because every business has its own terminology. So if I can just pick up a few, uh, a few of the, the, the words that they use, I always take the notes, then I can use those. It, it just makes it more, more live for them when I'm speaking if I'm using things which really relate to what they're doing. I used to find when I was working in retailing, I going to retail conferences got pretty boring um, uh, because nobody was going to say anything interesting because they didn't want to pass it on to the competition. And I used to go to other sectors, had great uh, conferences in the airline sector. And I think that's the point about an external speaker. It says things which perhaps uh, you can feel in a business, but are said in a different way, and you can take it on board. And I hope that this, that in talking about retail, uh, my experience at John Lewis, even if it's to a completely different different sector, it just engages the mind. Uh, I try not to be just entertaining. I hope I speak with interest. But if people have gone away and said, "Oh, that was that was fun." and then don't do any more. I've wasted my time. If they say, I was really interested in that, and it makes me think about my business and how I can draw that, interpret it in the way that suits my business and move forward, then I think that's been worthwhile.